Hi guys, good morning. I'm, um, I see there's 18 of you waiting. Um, I don't know if you saw my message on ESB or not this morning, but live chat is disabled because the district does not want your names um, on the internet, even though you, your presence on social media is probably more than any of us put together, but that's neither here nor there. So we're not allowed to do chat what they want to do. So I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see me. Um, if you could, somebody could click maybe the like button that would show me that you could hear me and see the document that's here. Anybody, please. Thank you guys. All right. So, um, yeah, the district does not want your names on the internet and what they want me to do or us to do who are doing live views or whatever is hold a live session. And then if you have questions, ask on Edsby. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just a little over the top that you have to keep. I mean, it's disruptive to your learning process, in my opinion. This is my opinion only. But it's disruptive to your learning process. If you're watching a video and you have a question, like a burning question that you want answered now, but you're going to keep watching the video and then forget about that question or forget what it was. Um, sorry, forget about the question or forget to ask because you get busy with something else. Then you never have your question answered because you have to go to Edsby to ask it. Um, so I'm disappointed in this. Um, I think it's a blow to learning, um, but it is what it is. So I have to abide by the rules. These rules came down the pipe early this morning. So um, what I'm going to do after the, after today is I'm going to pre-record the videos, just like when I do a tutoring video for you guys, and I'm going to post it and open it up for you guys to watch it at the date and time of your uh, class session. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe you guys could fight for this or something and say, you know, how ridiculous we think it is. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not trying to like sway your opinion or anything. I'm just saying that, you know, um, it's really terrible because you guys were really participating and doing great in here. And I feel like they just, you know, taking one more thing away from uh, learning. So again, that's just my opinion. But with that said, let's begin. I had to rant a little bit. Um, so we're going to uh, revisit some very, very important topics in calculus. And um, those important topics start out with the critical number, remember those, and go all the way up to existence theorems. And then I was, it was requested that I cover Rolle's theorem. Now, I'm not sure that Rolle's theorem is in your curriculum because I can't find it anywhere, but it's not hard, so I'll show it to you anyway. All right, so let's start with critical numbers. What are they? Critical numbers occur when the derivative equals zero or the derivative is undefined. If you remember way back in chapter two when we learned about critical numbers, I had shown you the graph of the thumbnail that was uh, part of this live stream. And I'm going to show it to you again in a second. <clears throat> but remember, a function f may have some maxes and mins on it, right? Some bumps on the graph. And when we take the derivative at those bumps, the derivative is zero. So the critical numbers are the zeros on the graph of the derivative and the bumps on the graph of the original function. So picture, let's see if my book will fit. I have to somehow get into the school building so I can go get my other table back because Ikea is closed. So I can't go buy a new one. But here's a picture that I showed you a long time ago. And what this is a, some function f, okay? It has bumps and cusps and all kinds of things going on. And what you're being asked is to identify the critical numbers, okay? So remember, critical points, sorry about the dog. This dog is gonna drive me insane. Um, the critical points are the bumps um, on the graph of the original function. The critical, oh, I'm so sorry. The critical numbers are the zeros or the places where the derivative is undefined. So for example, at C sub one here, this is a critical number because the derivative 
the slope of the tangent line at that point is zero, right? So on the graph of the derivative, I would see a zero there. Something's going to happen with the derivative. It's going to go, you know, f is decreasing. So uh, <clears throat> when f is decreasing, f prime would be below the x-axis. And when f is increasing, it goes above, right? Remember that, the gospel. So that's a critical number because there's a bump. Here's another critical number, right, where the slope is zero. Here's another one where the slope is zero and yet another one where the slope is zero. So those would be critical numbers on the graph of f prime. Now, this one here is a critical number because if I draw the slope of a tangent line, it's vertical. And we know that vertical lines are undefined, right? It's division by zero. So remember, by definition, and you can see it up here actually, um, f is called a crit um, sorry, a number c in the interior of the domain, so somewhere in the domain of the function f, is a critical number of f if either the derivative equals zero or the derivative is not defined. So if you can draw a vertical tangent line, that's going to mean that, um, you know, it's undefined there. The derivative is undefined there. All right. At c sub 4, you have a cusp here, right? And we know that derivatives don't exist at cusp. There's another one here at c sub 5 um, because the derivative can never attain a particular value, right? I've got a negative slope here and a positive slope here and a positive slope here and a negative slope here. Um, the derivative can never decide on what slope it's going to be, let's say it that way, at that point. Um, and um, so the derivative is not going to exist at a cusp, and you already know that. So therefore, those cusps would be considered critical numbers. Okay, so, and by the way, there's 29 of you in here right now, and I really appreciate that you're here. So critical numbers occur when the derivative is zero or undefined. Okay, why is this important? Because it brings us to the idea of local or relative. Remember, these two words mean the same thing. And global and absolute extrema. Okay, and these ideas tie in to the existence theorems. The intermediate value theorem uh, that's based off of the function has to be continuous. Um, the mean value theorem, the extreme value theorem. So the IBT, the MBT, and the EBT are all called existence theorems because they guarantee the existence of certain things, depending on the theorem, which we'll talk about later, but they don't tell you how to find them, okay? Um, what we're doing here is we're learning how to find them. And then, of course, there's Rolle's theorem, which is just sort of a, I don't know, uh, it's just sort of a special case of the MVT, okay? So, again, we'll talk about those later. Let's look at the local and the relative extrema. So we know, or hopefully we know, we remember that a local minimum occurs when the graph of the derivative or when the derivative values change from negative to the left of a particular point and positive to the right. Okay, so uh, I don't know, let me make a little sketch here of some function here. I'll call this function f. Now I can see from the picture that I have a minimum here, right? Um, and so listen, if I draw a little tangent line to the left of that point, it's negatively valued, right? And if I draw a little tangent line to the right of that point, it's positively valued. So when the derivative changes from negative, so this is the point in question, right? This extreme value, this minimum, when the derivative changes from negative to the left to positive on the right, we expect there to be a local or relative minimum. On the other hand, if we have a maximum, we would expect the opposite to occur. So, you know, let's just look at a quadratic, right? Here is a maximum value of this function. So we're talking about the y values, the height, the output value of the function, right? X might be 3, but y is 6 or something, right? So it's the highest output value. The derivative on the left is positively valued, and the derivative of the right is negatively valued. So when the derivative changes from positive on the left to negative on the right of a critical number or a critical point or some point that we're interested in, which we call c, then we're going to have a local maximum. Okay, I hope that makes sense. It should by now. 
How did we find those extreme values, those local extrema? Well, we learned about the first derivative test, right? The first derivative test, which we love to do, um, says you're going to take the function and find its derivative. Then you're going to set that derivative equal to zero, and you're going to solve, right, for x. And those x values that you find, since the derivative equals to zero, they're going to be the critical numbers or the zeros on the graph of f prime. Okay, so I'm going to do an example in a minute and remind you of the wiggle graph. Um, so what we did was we, we solved for f prime and got those x values, and we plotted those critical numbers on a wiggle graph, right? So we could determine if the, the derivative changes sign about those critical numbers. And if it went from positive to negative or negative to positive, then that would tell us, um, you know, whether or not we had a max or a min, okay? So just to refresh your memory, a trip down memory lane, we have a function. We have a quartic a polynomial, x to the fourth minus 4x cubed. And we want to find the relative max or min. So I just put a dash there. It could be one, the other. You could have more than one. So we take the derivative. I did that. Set equal to zero. And solve. Well, I can factor 4x squared out of there, so I did that, and I'm left with a factor of x minus 3. And then we set each factor equal to 0 to solve for x. So the two critical numbers that I get is x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 3, right? Then we plot them on a wiggle graph. Now remember, AP will not give you credit for a wiggle graph. They don't care that you can draw a wiggle graph. What they want to see is the logic behind your answer, okay? The mathematics behind your answer. So... Sorry about that. Let me just shut off my phone. So I plotted the critical numbers on the um, wiggle graph. And then I want to test. So remember, we have to test points in between those critical numbers. And we have to plug them or substitute them into the derivative function, not into the original function. All right. So if I test you know, uh, the derivative when x is negative 1. Well, I like to work with the factored form because it's really easy. You know, a negative times a negative is a positive, a negative times a positive is a negative, that kind of thing. So if I plug a negative 1 in here, I get a positive times a negative makes it negative. So from negative infinity all the way to 0, the, the, second, um, sorry, the first derivative takes on negative values. So I just put a little minus there. That just means my derivative is negatively valued from negative infinity to zero. And then I chose the number one in between zero and three and I plugged it into the derivative. Well, I get a positive four and a negative two, positive times a negative. Well, it's still negative. There's no sign change. So since the derivative does not change signs about this critical number, that means that there's no extreme values here, no extrema at the point where x equals to zero. Then I plugged in a four. When I plugged in a 4, I get a positive number times a positive number means that f prime is going to be positive. So the only sign change, so I'm looking at this wiggle graph for the sign change, and I see that f prime is negative here, positive here. Well, what does it mean when the derivative is negative or positive? We remember from the gospel, that thing that's hanging up on the wall in my classroom that I can't go to, that my students made for me. I will treasure that forever. We know that when the derivative is negative, f is decreasing. So f is decreasing from negative infinity all the way to 3. But when f prime is positive, that means the function, the original function, f is increasing. So when the derivative, so, you know, I can't draw this for the AP grader and say, oh, I have a minimum right here because it's the bottom of the bowl. No, they don't want to see that. I have to state for the grader in an FRQ since f prime changes from negative to the left of x equals 3 to positive on the right of x equals 3, that implies we would have a relative minimum at x equals 3. I should say at x equals 3. Okay? So the grader will want to see this, and they will want to see this. And they'll probably want to see that you tested uh, values into the derivative at that point. Onward.
here's another one that's a little more difficult because AP is not going to give you simple little polynomial functions. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, they're not all going to be easy. So, you know, during class, when we had class, you guys say, can you, can you not put that on my test? Or can you not give us one like that on the quiz? Because it's too hard. Well, AP is not going to say, oh, okay. <laughs> you have to know how to deal with it. And you do know how to deal with it because I taught you how to deal with it. Okay, so I have this function that may not look too nice, right? X, E to the X. And you say, and, and, and we're asking, you know, does any local extreme exist? If it does, indicate whether it's a max or a min. So, you know, you may look at that and say, oh, my gosh, you know, product rule. I hate the product rule. Well, guess what? The product rule is not that bad, right? We take the derivative of the first factor, multiply it by the second, plus leave the first factor alone, derivative of the second, right? Just like I did right here. And, in fact, I didn't even take the derivative yet. I'm showing the greater that, hey, I know the product rule format. You want to do that, okay? So there's my product rule. I'm telling the grader I'm going to take the derivative of this factor, leave that one alone, add to that this the first factor and the derivative of the second. And when I take the derivative, we know the derivative of x is 1, so 1 times e to the x is e to the x. And when I take the derivative of e to the x, well, that's a nice function because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so we get x e to the x for the second term. Okay, oh gosh, now i got to set that equal to zero. How do I do that? You know how to do it. I know that I can factor out an e to the x from both terms and rewrite what's left, and that's what I did. And I cannot stress this enough, and I know I stressed it in class before, but e to the x looks like this, right? It goes through the point zero, 1. It never, ever, ever reaches zero, okay? So guess what? I can't say e to the x equals 0 because that doesn't happen. So I don't have to worry about that factor. What I do have to worry about is this one. And if I solve for that, I get that x is equal to negative 1. And I can plot. That's a critical number. I can plot it on my wiggle graph, right? And at this point here, I'm just going to plug in a number to the left and a number to the right into my derivative to see what the sign of the derivative is. Well, I plugged in a negative 2. Now look, um, this is what I use, right? Just remember that if I plug in a negative 2, I've got e to the minus 2 times 1 to minus 2, right? But e to the minus 2 is the same as 1 over e squared, okay? So don't forget that, times a negative 1. Well, a positive times a negative makes my derivative a negative. I don't care what the value is. I just want to know, is it positive or negative? Well, if the derivative is negative from negative infinity to negative 1, that means that my function f is going to be decreasing. And when I plugged in a 0, because after all, we want to plug in the easiest values we can, if I plug in a 0, well, e to the 0 is 1, and 1 times 1 is 1. That's a positive number. So I know that my derivative is going to take on positive values from negative 1 to infinity, and my function will increase over that interval. And so what I expect is to have a relative minimum, right, the bottom of the bowl, at the point where x is equal to negative 1. So the first derivative test helps us to find local or relative extrema, maxes and mins, over a small interval um, very easily. Then we moved on to big boy and girl stuff. And we talked about absolute or global extrema. We want to know, are we dealing with the Mount Everest of the world or the Dead Sea, right? The very highest point on Earth or the very lowest point on Earth, okay? So this is over from negative infinity to positive infinity. We want to know what is the biggest and the smallest output value or height, okay, of the function. And in the case of global and absolute extrema, they're going to give you the endpoints of the interval. So those endpoints are a dead giveaway. Uh, when you see the words extrema or absolute or global and some endpoints, that means you better not forget those endpoints. And guess what? You already know how to do most of the work because you're going to do the same thing we did with the local extrema. You're going to take your function and find its derivative. 
you're going to set that derivative equal to zero to get the critical numbers. The only difference is, is now you're going to be given some, you know, endpoint from A to B. So we're looking in some interval um, where, you know, you're going to take now the critical numbers that you found and the endpoints of your interval. And you're not going to plug them into the derivative to see what the derivative's doing. You're going to actually plug them into the original function to see what the biggest and smallest output is. Whatever the largest output value is, that's your global maximum. And whatever the smallest output value is, that's your global minimum. So let's do an example, or maybe even two. Okay. First example. We're given a function, we're given an interval, and we're asked to find the absolute extrema for the function f, if it exists, okay? It does, but let's do it. So we're going to take the derivative, which is just 3x squared minus 3. And we're going to set that derivative equal to 0, right? And we're going to solve. So I got 3x squared is equal to 3, x squared is equal to 1, and so I get x values of plus and minus 1. Now, I have to work within this interval. I got two critical numbers here, negative 1 and 1, and I have the endpoints 1 and 3. So I can discard <clears throat> x equals negative 1 because it's not inside this interval. So the only critical number I need to deal with is x equals to 1, and guess what? It's already an endpoint of the interval, so I really only have to test the two endpoints in this case. How do I do it? I say, well, what is f of 1? And plug it in the first endpoint. Well, it's equal to 1 minus 3 plus 1, which is 2 minus 3, or negative 1. And what's f of 3? Well, if I plug the 3 in, I get 27 minus 9 plus 1, which is 28 minus 9, which is what, 19, 18, <laughs> 19? Okay, so that's all I can plug in. If I had some other critical numbers, like maybe I had x equals to 2, I would plug the 2 in here, okay? Well, out of the 2 that I needed to test, this is the smallest, so I know I'm going to have a global minimum at, <coughs> excuse me, x equals to 1, x equals to 1, and what is the minimum? It's negative 1. Okay, so a global minimum occurs at the point where x equals to 1, and its value, or its height, its y value, is negative 1. Likewise, a global maximum, this is going to be my global max, global maximum is going to occur when x equals to 3, and what is its value? It's 19. So I would say the global max is 19, and it occurs at x equals to 3. And the global min is negative 1, and it occurs at x equals 1. Now, I would ask you, is that OK, or do you have any questions? But I can't see you anymore. I just thought I'd throw that saltiness in. Let's do another one. So we have f of x is equal to x minus 2 sine of x. And the interval that we're working in is 0 pi over 2. OMG, there's a sign. It's OK. It's OK. It's not that bad. It really isn't. So that being said, let's try and figure it out. Let's take the derivative. Well, we get 1 minus 2 cos x. We're going to set that equal to 0, right? And I'm going to solve this for x. So I have, um, if I subtract 1 from both sides, I get negative 2 cos of x equals negative 1. So cos of x is 1 half. Now, in the interval from 0 to pi over 2, when is the cosine equal to 1 half? Well, it's equal to 1 half when x is equal to pi over 3, right? Remember the unit circle. So guess what? I have to ask myself, is this critical number in this interval? Yeah, it is, right? If I remember back from my unit circle, this is 0 comma 2 pi, this is pi over 2, and this is the angle 
pi over three. Okay, so this critical number is in my interval, so that means I have to test this along with both endpoints, where in the original function. Okay, so let's test the first endpoint because it's easy. If I plug zero into f, I get zero minus two sine of zero. Rem oh, zero, not theta. Remember that the sine of zero is zero, so f of zero, zero. If I plug in the second endpoint, well, that's easy too. That's pi over 2 minus 2 times the sine of pi over 2. That's pi over 2 minus 2 times 1 because the sine of pi over 2 is 1. Now, you know, I may have to take a calculator here. Um, and what I get here is uh, uh, negative 0.429. Now I'm going to test pi thirds, f of pi over 3. Well, that's pi over 3 minus 2 times the sine of pi over 3. Well, you know what the sine of pi over 3 is. It's root 3 over 2, right? Remember over here at pi over 6, uh, remember the coordinates x, y go cosine, sine, so the cosine was root 3 over 2, and the sine is 1 half. And since they're co-functions over here at 60 degrees, so from the 30, 60, 90 triangle, the cosine becomes 1 half, and the sine becomes root 3 over 2. So these two kind of swap places um, on the unit circle. And there's a reason for that. But it, that doesn't matter for these purposes. The purposes, what it matters is that you know what the value is. But anyway, you would probably have a calculator to figure this out because, you know, these twos cancel. So what I really have is pi over three minus root three. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what that is. So, um, you know, I can take a guesstimate, but um, anyway. Uh, so I'm going to use my calculator. Ella. I'm going to use my calculator. And I'm going to, so to enter in your calculator, you know, you just uh, pi key, second pi divided by three. Okay. Um, actually, let me put that in parentheses because um, I don't trust, oops, I don't trust this calculator. So pi divided by three, okay, minus root three. And that's negative 0.684. Okay, so now I have to decide what's my global max and what's my global min. Well, the global min here, that's going to occur. Now look, this is negative 0.684 and this is negative 0.429. So this one's smaller. So the global min um, is negative 0.684 and occurs at x equals pi over 3. And the global max, well, there's only one big number and it's 0 in this case is zero, and that occurs at x equals zero. So I know for this function, I'm going to have a global maximum at x equals to zero and a global min minimum at x equals to pi over three. And in fact, I'm going to put this into my calculator. Whoa, my window is masked up. And here comes the function. Okay, so remember, my interval goes from 0 to pi over 2. Um, and pi over 2 is like right around here. So my highest point is at 0, and my lowest point occurs at pi over 3, which happens to be negative 0.68, whatever. And in fact, if I could, so in other words, these are rarely calculator problems um, because if you had a calculator, you can just graph the function, just do, I'm going to do um, second calc minimum uh, three, little to the left, little to the right, 
Oh, did I make an error? Why do I have 1.4? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's pi over 3. Um, that's pi over 3 right there, 1.407. Um, but look at the, if you see that, the output value or the height of the function at pi over 3 is negative 0.684. So, you know, if I could use a calculator, I don't have to do any of this work. I can just throw the original function and use second calc max and min and find my answers. Um, but AP is not going to make that happen generally. So you're going to have to do it by hand, and you would have to show them that you're substituting those values back into the function f. Global max, global min. And that brings us to some of the theorems. I tried to break these down as simple as I could. Um, so let's roll with them. So we have three that are called existence theorems. Again, they guarantee the existence that these things are going to happen or must happen. Just doesn't show you how to find them. Now, the intermediate value theorem, or the IBT, as we use, and you can use that on the IB, on the I, IB, AB, AP exam, uh, as well. They know what IVT and MVT and EVT are. Um, you're probably rarely going to use this one, though. You used it in Algebra. I don't know if you used it in Algebra 1, but probably in Algebra 2 you used it uh, to find the roots or zeros of a function. Okay, But what the intermediate value theorem says is the following. So this is the formal definition. If a function f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, and f of a does not equal f of b, then for every value of k between f of a and f of b, there exists at least one value of c in the open interval a, b, such that f of c equals to k. Oh my god, that's so much. I don't know what any of that means. Yes, you do. Okay, let's take it piece by piece. If a function is continuous, you know, think of a roller coaster. You're going to go to Bush Gardens and get on the biggest roller coaster. And when you notice there's a big hole in the track, I'm not going on that roller coaster. Okay. Why? Because the roller coaster is not continuous. If I take, if I go sit in that car and they turn the roller coaster on, I'm going to plummet to my death or something, right? Or get hurt very badly if I take that roller coaster ride because when the car gets to that big hole, it's going to fall through it and I'm going to land on the ground. So I don't want to go on a roller coaster with a hole in it, okay? So I want to make sure I'm jumping on a roller coaster that is smooth and continuous, right? So continuous function means you can get from point A to point B without falling through the hole or <laughs> any bad things happening to you, okay? Um, you know, I can get in my car and drive to work and hopefully, you know, none of the roads that I'm taking have broken apart or anything like that. There's not a river in between. It's, it's continuous. So if a function is continuous on a closed interval, so from A to B, okay, and F of A does not equal F of B. In other words, the Y values are not the same, okay? Uh, then for every value K, so Here's my k for every value. So, so remember the word value means the height or the y value, okay? So for every value k between f of a and f of b, there must be at least one point in between those, which we call c, uh, such that the function at that point exists. In other words, if this is my roller coaster and I'm over here, happy to take a ride on the roller coaster, and I see there's a big hole here, I'm not getting on. But if there's not a hole there, that means that the point exists and I can get on with confidence and start at, you know, the starting point of the roller coaster and ride it all the way to the very end. Okay, so it just guarantees us that a function um, is going to have, if you want to get from point A to B, then there must be exist all points in between A and B to get there. I hope that made sense. This one is a, I love the mean value theorem. This is one of my favorite theorems. I have many favorite theorems, but this one I just love because it just makes so much sense. And students generally like this one too. That's probably why I love it because students have the least amount of difficulty with this one. Um, and um, 
you know, it makes them happy that they can do the theorem and then it makes me happy. So anyway, MVT, the mean value theorem. Here's the formality. If a function is continuous on a closed interval and differentiable, so this word and is very important. If it's continuous on a closed interval and it's differentiable on the open interval, meaning that, remember, we don't take derivatives at endpoints. Okay, so the closed interval means we're including the endpoints, where the open interval means we're not including those endpoints. So it's differentiable. Then this backwards E means there exists, okay, then there exists a number C in the open interval such that the derivative at that point is equal to the slope of the secant line. The instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. Oh my gosh, all of these things mean the same thing. Remember way back when in chapter two, when <clears throat> you were finding slopes of secant lines on a graph, right? What did you have to do to find the slope of a secant line? You'd start at point A and you would draw a line to point B and you would compute the slope of that line. So the line that connects the endpoints of an interval is called a secant line. And since it's a line, it's really easy to compute the slope of it, right? Maybe that's a slope of one or something. Kind of looks like it, but who knows? I'm just eyeballing it, right? Well, what this says is that at some point in this interval, some point C, the slope of the tangent line, if I could draw a tangent line to this curve at some point, it's going to be, if it's going to be the same as the secant line, it means it's going to be parallel to the secant line because their slopes are the same. So I don't know, maybe I have a point C right about here. The slope of my tangent line to this point C is equal to the slope of my secant line. I might also have, I'm going to call this one C sub 1. You know, that could happen more than once. I might have some other point for which I could draw a tangent line and it's parallel to or equivalent to the slope of a, of a secant line. So the mean value theorem is just, I don't know, beautifully stated and uh, it's just clear by itself. We'll do some examples on these in a minute. Okay, I just want to get through the theorems. So I hope that's okay. You probably understood this one better than the IBT, but... Now the extreme value theorem, the EBT. Again, it's an existence theorem, okay? And it doesn't tell you how to find these things, but you already know how because I taught you, and I taught you well. If a function f is continuous on a closed interval, then, one, there exists some number c in that closed interval such that f of x is less than or equal to f of c for all x in the closed interval a, b. Number two, there exists a d in the closed interval a, b, such that f of x is greater than or equal to f of d for all x in the interval, in the closed interval, a, b. What it really means in layman's terms is, if you've got a continuous function over a closed interval, a, b, then that function takes on a max and a min somewhere on that interval. That's all it means. You're not going to have to prove this or anything, okay? But the function, it guarantees, this, this theorem, the EBT, guarantees the existence of a maximum and a minimum on a closed interval for a function. So geometrically speaking, or by a picture, I guess you could call it, here's my function f, okay? We start at a to b. This is the interval we're working in, okay? And what it says here is, is that if f of x is less than or equal to f of c, in other words, my function output values, my y values, are less than the value at f of c, this has to be the greatest output value, right? And in this case here, so here's my c. Uh, notice if this is c, this is the point c comma f of c. Notice that it's the highest point on the graph, right? And... <clears throat> 
I have this point D over here. So this point is the point D comma F of D. So I just put the little F of D over there. Okay. It says there also exists a D in that interval such that the function's output values are bigger than or equal to F of D. Well, if I look to the right of that point and to the left of that point, all of those Y values or heights are higher than this one. So the extreme value theorem just guarantees the existence of a max and a min in a closed interval. And here's some other fun and important facts. A function can attain its max or min more than once. Think of the sine of X as the perfect function. We know, <coughs> excuse me, that the sine of X goes on and on and on forever and attains a height, you know, of let's say one, because that's the easiest, on and on and on forever, right? I can keep going in both directions with this thing. Well, I can't draw backwards. But anyway, attains a height of one here, attains a height of one there, attains a height of one there. Many, many times, infinitely many times. So a function can attain its max and min, and the sine also attains a min at negative one infinitely many times, um, more than once. Extreme values often occur at endpoints of the domain. We're talking global extrema. Okay, this theorem guarantees the existence of the max and the min. How do we find it? It doesn't tell us how to find it. We know how to find it. We use the first derivative test to find the critical numbers and then take the critical numbers and the endpoints of the interval and plug it back into the original function to figure out what's the biggest and smallest output value, right? So you know how to do that. And then for a constant function, so a function that looks like this, like y equals to two I put, the max and the min values are equal. So if you're given a function like this and you're asked, what is the maximum and minimum value? Well, it's the same. It's two. They're the same. And that can happen. And in this case, right, f of b, uh, sorry, f of x would, so, you know, back to this thing here. Oops. Sorry about this, you guys. So there's that function y equals two here. In this case here, f of x is less than or equal to, so, you know, f of 1 is equal to f of 2, and f of 0 is equal to f of 1 is equal to f of 2, and so forth, right? So the functions can be equal to, if you forget about the less than part, to f of c, or the function can be greater than or equal to, so if you forget about the greater than part, the inequality part, uh, equal to f of d. So the max and mins can actually be the same height. Okay, let's look at Rolle's theorem. <clears throat> Rolle's theorem. Again, I don't think this is part of AB. I'm not positive. I did look at your at the glance, you know, uh, calculus at a glance. I don't see Rolle's theorem on there at all. So um, I don't know. I taught it in IB. I always taught the theorems in IB. Um, and IB used to take AP exams. But, um, you know, in the IB exams, they definitely used it. But in the AP exams, it wasn't taught like toward AP. It was taught, taught for IB. So I never taught it with respect to it being on an AP exam. But um, I don't see it in the curriculum as far as the AP at a glance. I could be wrong on that. I'm still checking. So I'll let you know. A Rolle's theorem is not hard. It's just a special case of the mean value theorem. So let's look at it. Rolle's theorem says that if a function is continuous on a closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, and f of a equals f of b. So there's three conditions here. The function has to be continuous, it has to be differentiable, and f of a must equal f of b. <clears throat> then there exists some number c in that open interval such that the derivative equals zero. Hey, we just did derivative equals zero, right? So this came out kind of messy because um, <laughs> I was writing fast because I was interrupted like a million times yesterday when I was trying to get this ready for today. The kids were going nuts on Edsby yesterday. So um, anyway, uh, I had interruptions and I was trying to, I didn't want to rewrite it. <clears throat> but what we need to make sure of when we're using Rolle's theorem is these three things. 
the function has to be continuous. Well, that's just the intermediate value theorem, right? The function must be differentiable. That's the mean value theorem. And f of a has to equal to f of b, okay? So what this means altogether is that the function, or Wohl's theorem means, the function must have a horizontal tangent if there are two places where the function takes on the same value. Well, what does it mean, two places where the function takes on the same value? It means that their heights are the same, their y values are the same. I'll show you a picture in a second. Okay, so back to this. There must be a relative min or max, right, or a local extreme value between two places where the function takes on the same value. So if you think of a parabola, like this one, ding, magic, right? Here's a parabola frowning, right? The frowning function, like I did this morning when I got my message about live videos. But anyway, again, just a little saltiness. Here's some parabola, some quadratic function. Maybe it's not, maybe it's some other function, but I'm focusing <clears throat> on this particular piece, okay? Rolls theorem says, First of all, this function is continuous. There are no holes in the roller coaster, right? It's differentiable. I can find the derivative of every point between A and B. That's what happens when it's continuous. We can find the derivative, right? And f of A equals f of B. Well, this is the point A, f of A. And this is the point. All right, so my B is a little off, but you know, I can't draw, right? B comma F of B. That's a B. No, let me make my A a little higher. You see how those heights are the same? So just pretend along with me, okay? Because I can't draw. Those two points are the same height or take on the same values. And what Rolle's theorem says is there must be a relative min or max in between those somewhere. That's it. Here's another picture, which I did much better. So this was a max, right? Because remember, according to the theorem, right? If a function is continuous, differentiable, and f of a equals to f of b, then there's going to be some number in between such that the derivative equals to zero. Well, that just means a horizontal tangent line. Here's the other picture again. Here's the point a f of a. Here's the point b f of b. They're the same, or pretend they are. They're the same height, the same y value. Rolle's theorem says if this function is continuous, it is. If it's differentiable, it is. If f of a equals f of b, meaning their heights are the same, they are. Then there must be some number somewhere in between those two points where the derivative equals to zero, and we call that number c. So if I go up here and plot my point c, this would be the point c f of c, I can draw a horizontal tangent line, and that's a minimum for that function. It's pretty neat stuff. Let's just look at a few examples, and then I'm going to stop, and I'll let you go in and explore the homework on SB. So first question. Now, I'm going to tell you, I looked up a bunch yesterday of questions. The EBT and the IBT and the MBT are mostly all in multiple choice questions on the AP exam. Okay, so this is something I learned. They're mostly all in the multiple choice section. You're not having a multiple choice test. You're having an FRQ that takes 45 minutes. Now, could they slip something in? Sure, there's many applications where we could slip in an MBT or EBT or Rolle's theorem um, type question in an FRQ, um, but I need to figure out more about that because the majority of them did come from multiple choice. And now that you're not having that, you know, I don't know to what extent. I mean, you know, they're giving you one. Well, okay, if it's a 45-minute FRQ, I'm going to think it's like a normal FRQ where you have three problems and you have 15 minutes, 15 minutes per problem to solve it, to get it solved. So... I'll let you know. Um, I am looking into that, and I'll let you know more for sure. But I'm going to try and find some more FRQs. Um, I went through a bunch yesterday, and um, there were hardly any that contained any of these where you actually had to apply the theorem anyway. Okay, so. But here's some from multiple choice type problems. So 
You're given a function, you're given an interval, and it says, show that the mean value theorem can be applied to the function f and find the number c which satisfies the conclusion. Oh God, what's the conclusion of the, uh -huh, what is it? You know what it is. This is the conclusion of the mean value theorem, right? So remember from geometry, you had if then statements, right? You had a hypothesis after the word if, and then after the word then you had the conclusion of the statement. All of these theorems are in if then form, okay? So the conclusion of the mean value theorem is this right here, okay? So this is what I need to show. Okay, well, this is a pretty easy problem. I know that if I rewrite f of x like this, then the derivative is going to be really easy to take. So I took the derivative, and I got this here, and I rewrote it as 3 over x squared. Okay, So what I have to do is, first of all, is show that f prime of x is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Well, this is your a. Oops, sorry. This is your a, and this is your b, right? So I have to plug in. I have to find f of 1, f of 3, and then, of course, 3 minus 1 gives me 2 down here. So that's what I did. I computed f of 3 and got 4. I computed f of 1 and I got a 2. So what I'm saying is, is that the derivative is equal to 2 over 2 or 1. And then you're going to cross multiply and solve. So here I get x is equal to plus or minus root 3. Well, negative root 3 falls outside of this interval, so I can get rid of it. It's not an element of that um, interval. So the c that I'm looking for is the square root of 3. This is the value that's going to make this happen. Oops, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep going out of the frame. Uh, the square root of 3 is going to be the value that makes those two equivalent. Here's one on Rolle's theorem. If f of x is equal to this polynomial on 1, 2, does Rolle's theorem apply? And if it does, find the value of c. Okay, I have to check a couple of things. The first thing I have to check is, is this a continuous function? Yes, it is. All polynomials are continuous, nice and smooth, not a problem. Is it differentiable? All polynomials are differentiable. So, yeah, I'm good, right? Now I have to check does f of 1 equal f of 2. So I plug the numbers in and I see that 0 equals to 0. So guess what? Since this function and this interval or this function on this interval meet all three of these criterion, then I can say Rolle's theorem applies. Now I have to find the c. How do I find the c? I take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and solve. So I did that. I got x is equal to 3 halves. Now you got to be careful. Because, again, this x value that you get, or c value, it has to fall inside your original interval. So our interval was 1, 2. 1 and a half is definitely between 1 and 2. So, yeah, I can say, therefore, at x equals to 3 halves, which is an element or in the closed interval 1 to 3, the slope of the tangent line is equal to 0. So the value, or our c value, is 3 halves. I put a smiley there because that was before I got the news this morning. I was happy. Now it's like this. Uh, okay, one more. f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. On the interval from negative 1 to 1, does Rolle's theorem apply? If so, find the value c. Well, is this a continuous function? Yes, it is. Right. By the way, you know what? Hold these thoughts for a second. Remember our definition for continuity, what it means for a function to be continuous? A function is continuous if, number one, the limit, as x approaches a, of that function exists, meaning that the limit, as x approaches a from the left, oops, sorry, has to equal the limit as x approaches a from the right, right? The limits have to be the same value. So the limit exists at this point if from the left and the right we head toward the same height, right? So in order for a function to be continuous, the limit has to exist. The function at that point must exist. 
okay? No holes or breaks or anything like that, right? And three, the limit as x approaches a has to equal the function output at a. So that gave me the opportunity to just give you a quick little review on what it means for a function to be continuous since we're talking a lot about continuity in these theorems. Brilliant. Anyway, don't forget those because that's super important. Our function is definitely continuous. Okay, I can take my pen. There's no holes, there are no breaks or anything. I can take my pen and start here and trace over it without lifting my pen off the paper. This is a continuous function, okay? The problem is it's not differentiable at the cusp, right? Or the sharp corner. I can't differentiate that at x equals to zero. So I'd have to state in some way that, you know, it is continuous, by the way, if I, is f of negative 1 equal to f of 1, right? That's the third um, criterion for Rolle's theorem is that f of a has to equal to f of b. So I went ahead and plugged those in. Those work. I get the same output value. But Rolle's th uh, theorem fails at x equals to 0 because f is not differentiable there. I hope that makes sense to you guys. And um, like I said, I will try to find some more problems that maybe are a little more FRQE for this um, and um, let you know more about whether for A, B anyway, you have to deal with role. I think role's theorem is kind of fun and I, you probably would agree with me um, that it's pretty easy to grasp and, you know, it's kind of a cute little theorem uh, to work with. Um, and it's pretty straight to the point versus say the IVT where I'm, you know, mumbling off all this stuff. Um, and you're like, what? So um, it's a pretty straightforward and cute little theorem to deal with. And um, so, you know, it'd be nice if it is on there, but I really don't think that it is. So anyway, I did put some Rolle's theorem, I believe, in your homework on WebAssign. Your work is there. It's due on Monday. Go in there, have some fun with it. If you have any questions, any problems, you know where to reach me. As be or remind only boys and girls. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't deal with it. Oops. All right. And um, anyway, you guys have a great rest of your day and let me know if you have any problems or issues and I'll be more than happy to help you. See you later, alligators.